Welcome, welcome, welcome to another episode of Real Folk Mississippi. Uh, it's been a while. I know it's been a while. Uh, it's been a crazy summer, but we are finally here with the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Lawrence Patrick. Well, thank you for having me. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Yeah, I'm doing quite well. How about yourself? I'm I'm good, man. Like I said, it, it's been a it's been a um, summer. You know? <laughs> um, but we're here. And I'm finally happy that we can sit down. We've been trying to uh, schedule this for quite a while. For quite a while. <laughs> so now we're here. Absolutely. And, and so I, I, let's just um, jump right into it. Um, okay. So you started this. This is this is your uh, creation. Yes, sir. Right? And it's been in construct or it's been here for how long? Twenty seven years now. Twenty seven years. Twenty seven okay. years. Okay. So so what made you want to? Build like a a, a, a jujitsu martial arts place, like in Picayune, Mississippi, of all places. Because <laughs> well, I'm, I'm assuming you've been around the world. <laughs> well, I don't know about around the world, but um, we were in Slidell, Louisiana, for twenty four and a half years before okay. we came out to Picayune. Okay. Prior to that, living or in having a business in Slidell, most of our students came from Picayune, so we were familiar okay. with them. Okay, uh, most of our are better fighters, you know, or more disciplined athletes were coming from the Picayune area. So. Really? Yes, sir. And well, we had the opportunity to sell the building that we were in because we actually owned that building instead of renting. We mm -hmm. had an opportunity to sell it. It was in a, let's say it was in an area that had a lot of promise when we first bought the building, okay. but nothing really developed around there. So we were kind of off the beaten path. Okay. Um, luckily, we had a lot of word of mouth. Yeah. Uh, but we had an opportunity to sell and then open a gym here in Picayune, which we've been very happy. And uh, we're building a house here in Picayune now. So we're, uh, you know, we, we've always loved the people from here. You know, okay. some of the best friends I've met doing this have been from the Mississippi area. Okay. So how did you get involved in MMA, period? Like what? It's a long story, but. Okay. <laughs> hey, we're, hey, we're here. That's what we're here for. <laughs> we're here. Uh, I guess the passion for martial arts in general started when I was about 12 years old. Okay. I received a punching bag as a Christmas gift. It was a very big, for my size, okay. like probably 70 pounds. Now I look at that and I go, that's a small bag. A small when I was 12 bag, years yeah. old, it was a big bag. <laughs> I bet, know, yeah, and, uh, yeah. It hit me back just as hard as I hit it sometimes. Okay. And, uh, you know, I would just emulate what I saw on TV, watching okay. Bruce Lee movies, watching boxing, and, mm -hmm. you know, I didn't have any training. I was just out there hitting a bag, beating beating the hell out of it and beating the hell out of myself sometimes and uh you know so i, I always had the, the the desire i guess to do it just from trying to imitate what i saw on tv you know a lot of the kung fu theater and uh you know stuff that was on television at the yeah. time. it influenced me a lot um my father had uh well my family had a, a seafood business on veterans boulevard in kenner louisiana nice and as a kid we spent a lot of time especially summers you know, we didn't have daycare. You know, we, mm -hmm. we hung around at the business. And nice. and uh, at the business, they had a, a, a karate studio. Uh, a gentleman by the name of Ron Denninger owned it. And as a kid, he probably saw my face pressed up against the glass, yeah. you know, many, many, many times. Yeah, I had a lot of time to kill. And I was just amazed. Oh, look at these guys, what they could do. They're punching, yeah. kicking, jumping yeah. in the air, breaking boards and bricks. Yeah. You know, and I, and I was one of the to kind of do it but you know my family had their own business they were busy and it just uh just something that really never developed when, when i was 13 or okay or so. uh, my father passed very unexpectedly of a heart attack when he was only 42 years old oh, uh, you know no no health problems per se leading up to that just we went on a fishing trip that day and by that evening he was gone you know so uh, i was Jeez. 14 you know, didn't have a lot of, uh, I had a lot of anger, uh, a, a lot of just just frustration of, you know, why? Why why God did this? Yes. You know, why did he take my father? He was a good man. Mm -hmm. You know, he wasn't done raising me. <laughs> you know, yeah, I'm yeah, 14, exactly. you know, yeah. I mean, now more than ever. Mm -hmm. And um, from that point, though, it, it led me into martial arts uh, formally. Okay. You know, because I needed something, you know, to uh, contain the anger, the aggression. The uh, I was going to go one of two paths, down a bad path mm. or down a good path. Okay. Fortunately, I found um, 
a gentleman who owned a, a health club. It was called Crescent City Health Club at the time okay. uh, in Metairie. Mm-hmm. He had a martial arts school inside of that health club. It was called Martin School of Judo Jiu-Jitsu Incorporated. Okay. Now, I didn't realize at the time he was the owner of the whole gym. Okay, know? but he was. He was. Yeah. Um, he kind of took me under his wing. Okay. You know, I told him my story. I would get driven there by my cousin because I wasn't even old enough to drive. Yeah, yeah, know? yeah. My cousin uh, covered for me a lot, let's just say. And okay. my, as far as my mother knew, I was going to the health club. And I wasn't truly lying because it was a health club. She didn't know I was taking martial arts and punching, kicking, getting punched, getting kicked, grappling, jujitsu, arm bars, chokes, you know. What do you think, do you think she would have let you do it if she, if you had been up front with her from the beginning? Absolutely not. <laughs> wow, okay. But, you know, because she just lost her husband. Yeah. You know, Makes I'm sense. her only son. Mm-hmm. I had two sisters. Okay. And to me... You know, I, I think she was just going to be overprotective, mm-hmm. you know, and, and I, I could see it through her perspective now that yeah. I'm an adult and I have kids. Yeah. Um, but at the time, I didn't think it, it would have a snowball's chance in hell of really ever. It was like, no, know, mom, yeah. we're not, we're right. not going to even go there. Mom. I'll <laughs> so, let you know later. So, right, right. Yeah. Uh, let, let her know much later. But, yeah. but <laughs> how, wait, wait, how, how, <laughs> well, wait, 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 you can't do that. <laughs> how long are we talking here? Well, uh, I started in 1983. That was okay. when my father passed, and I was training within probably a month of okay. that. Uh, it wasn't until 1993, so a full ten years. You waited a decade. Well, <laughs> I would have wait, I would have waited longer. Than that, to be honest. <laughs> but I knew I was going to be on television for the Olympic trials. So they trapped you. you, they, you I was I was trapped. I had to come clean because I knew it was like, oh my gosh, this is going to be on television. If if I can I can make sure my mom isn't watching TV at that time. But we have aunts, uncles, cousins, grandparents. They're going to see it. Somebody's going to tell my mom. Did you did you ever think that like maybe this is the best <laughs> way she can find out? You see, <laughs> I her really son do. is on television. I, for I really do because. It was easier because, you know, this is already past my kickboxing career. Yeah. You know, I was already a pro, pro kickboxer fighting. Yeah. And, and this was the Olympic trials, which happened years after I quit kickboxing. Okay. You know, so, so yeah, I mean, you're fighting for your country. <laughs> right, exactly. Come on, you can't get in the way of me serving my country. Come on. This is America. Exactly. Yeah. So, <laughs> So, of course, after I had to tell her and she, she saw the news footage, yeah. and, she, and then she was like, oh, I'm so proud of you, son. I'm like, yeah, but okay. we would have never gotten to this point if I hadn't done it the way I did it. Okay. Did it. Oh, that, that's interesting. You know, like, <laughs> so, so okay. I'm be- taking it to my grave if I do that. <laughs> <laughs> so, b- before, talk me through before telling her what did you think was going to happen what do you think was her reaction was going to be that day you're like okay oh i got to i got to do this uh, i mean i was i was nervous i mean you yeah. know even though i'm yeah you know, at this point i'm a grown up I, I, i'm a fighter i, yeah. I got to do all this stuff i'm afraid of my mother <laughs> hey I, i'm right there with you i, I respect her yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah i respect, I respect love this yeah. woman and yeah. i, I I have a healthy respect in, 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 I don't want to say fear. Fear might not be the right word, but I respect but fear. her. Right. Fear. <laughs> fear of disappointing her. Okay, yeah. You, you know, that because I, she was she was dealt a tough hand in life to lose her husband so so young. So early, yeah. Um, so unexpectedly, too. Mm-hmm. No one saw it coming. And, you know, to me, I, I wanted to protect her. Yeah. You know, and I wanted to be that golden boy. And I got into a lot of crap that she didn't know about till later. But, like Amen. I said... And it wasn't just fighting; it was all kind of other stuff. Hey, yeah, but yeah. It, it led me to where I am gotcha. today, mm-hmm. you know, and, and ultimately the opening of this this gym. You know? Do Do you have kids that come here under the same story that you have? Maybe loss of a family member, or I don't want to tell my mom yet. Do, do those things have those things happen? S- similar time? stories. I wouldn't yeah. say identical, but yeah. but certainly people that uh, lack a father figure in their yeah. life for whatever yeah. reason, whether yeah. they just didn't have a dad growing up, they or whether they had a dad in the past. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I notice we tend to attract a lot of those people mm-hmm. that you know, in general, or people that may be at a crossroads in their life, where they may be turning into a life of crime, you know, in trouble, or putting into something positive. Positive. Do, do you think that? How heavy of a connection do you think 
loss and uncertainty and those times of crisis play in getting new kids to come here to do that? Is that part of everyone's story? Do you just have some people that go, look, I just want to try it? Oh, yeah. The thing about martial arts is it, it appeals to a variety of different people for a variety of different reasons. Okay. Uh, I tend to relate more to the people that have uh, some kind of traumatic event that brought them to this place Makes in sense. their life. But yeah. for some people, it's just like, hey, I think it's really cool. I want to learn how to do this stuff. I, I want, you know, I need some fitness in my life or I, I want to learn some self-defense. Mm -hmm. You know, to the people that just really need this place, you mm -hmm. know, because I, when I needed martial arts the most, it was there for me. Gotcha. And it changed my life. Okay. So, um, we talk about the, 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 you know, mother safety aspect. <laughs> yes. And, uh, we talk about, you know, how, um, obviously if anyone's seen MMA, you know, that it is a somewhat violent sport, right? And by somewhat, I mean, extreme. <laughs> <laughs> it's, so, you know, uh. Yeah. <laughs> it, but, it looks it looks a lot more violent, but you know, okay. I, I I would say that football is even more dangerous. Okay, so so and that's where I'm going with this. Like, how do you sell this to parents that are worried? Like, look, I don't want my son to get kicked in the head and concussion right. or choked out to the point where you know, like those things. How do you sure. um, ensure or I, I guess? How do you make it to where it's okay, you know, for the parents? Well, parents. you try to explain to them that it visually looks worse than it is. You okay. know, in reality, you're getting hit with fist and feet, mm -hmm. you know, shins, yep. knees. You know, equate that to a, a linebacker in pro football who mm -hmm. can run as fast as a track star and have a lot more body weight. Yeah. Their whole body is colliding with your body. And, and that is a lot of, whether you have pads or not, that's a lot of trauma. Gotcha. It's a lot of brain trauma, mm -hmm. a lot of knee issues, yes. you know, and I tell them, I played two years of high school football. I had more injuries in high school football of those two years than I did my entire fighting career, 26 really? pro kickboxing matches, and just training. Seriously? You know, absolutely. It's a lot wow. more superficial. You know, yeah, you can get a cut. Yeah, you can get a nosebleed. Yeah, mm -hmm. you can get a contusion, a yeah. bump, a bruise. It's more superficial. Yeah. You know, of course, there's always a risk of greater injury. Well, yeah, but, but it's not common at all. Yeah, like the the broken bones that I've seen have been accidents. You know, like kicking and Absolutely. someone knee checks you, and it's just, it's just you know broken. Yeah. Oh wow! And it wasn't like somebody grabbed a leg and I like, yeah, 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 yeah. So off the top turnbuckle like wrestling, nothing like that. Yeah. Um, so it, it it visually looks worse because people are balling up their fists and they're throwing punches and kicks mm -hmm. at. An opponent, so it looks more aggressive. Okay, you know, because it looks like a fight. But yeah. you know, to these guys, they're trained athletes. It's a sport. I got you. You know, not not just a, a fight out of anger. Okay. You know. Yeah, I, I've heard that, and maybe you can speak to this. There are a lot more injuries in bar fights or school fights than there yeah, are there's in the lots ring. Of, you can fall on concrete. You're on a padded ring. You have a cage that keeps you kind of contained, mm -hmm. you know, from falling out. Mm -hmm. You know, you can, you know, a, a lot of times in, in a street altercation, the, the worst injury <coughs> is not the actual punch that knocks them out. It's their head colliding with the concrete, mm -hmm. you know, and that quick, oh, you yep. know, the brain's bouncing around. You know, many people have died from that. Okay, yeah, yeah. and... You know, I, 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 from what I've seen, you know, the, the, the value of having a place where you can come and figure out how to control your physical self absolutely helps you a lot with controlling your mind outside of this place. And I've, I've talked all to, aspects of your life. Yeah, and I, and I've talked to some you know fighters, and they're like, you know, it's not really about like the fight, really. Yeah. It's more about the training. It's so. about the training, about the control, about the lessons that you carry over into all aspects of your life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, training in martial arts, whether it's jiu-jitsu, kickboxing, you know, mm -hmm. MMA, mm -hmm. it's all problem solving under high stress, which is a lot like life. You know, I mean, yeah. you think about it. You're on the mat with somebody. They're trying to control you. They're trying to choke you. They're trying to hit you. Mm -hmm. And you have to solve this puzzle. Of how to under high stress, right? Getting hit, yeah. Uh, getting you know potentially submitted, a, a joint lock or a choke, yeah. And you have to figure it out. You know, if if uh, if you don't figure it out, you get caught, you tap out, you learn, yeah. You continue, you know. But it, it's all about just when you start getting um, 
problems in life, they pale by comparison to the problems you deal with on a daily basis right here on these mats. Yeah, no one's punching you in the face. You know? <laughs> Hopefully yeah, not. With love. With love, yeah, yeah. <laughs> or lovingly, like, hey, I could be drilling you right now. Yeah. But, it, you know, instead we're, we're, we're moderately contacting each other to let you know, hey, your face is wide open. You might want to deal with that problem. You know, okay. you might want to try to tie up my limb. You might want to buck your hips. Yeah. You know, so it's, uh, it's encur- we try to encourage each other while learning. Okay. You know, while, while learning and, and figuring out this whole journey of martial arts. And so that what makes it a brotherhood. Absolutely. Yeah. So it is a family. It mm-hmm. is definitely a family atmosphere. Okay. So so let's go. Let's let's push to let's go back to the Olympics. Yes. Okay. Sir. So you're um, figuring out that you're going to um, you know represent your country. Mm-hmm. Can you take us through? What happened through that whole process? A lot of people don't know about it. I don't talk about it a lot because I, I don't. Yeah. I don't run a taekwondo gym, and it was you know taekwondo for the Olympics. Um, taekwondo, taekwondo, like Billy Blanks like type stuff. Absolutely. Oh, okay. Like, you know, uh, like that. That's nice. We, um, I got an invitation to train. Okay. For the this was shortly after the ninety two games. So it was ninety three when I would have okay. got my first invitation to train. Kind of out of the blue. It's like, wow, what's this in the mail? Yeah. I'm, I'm invited to try out for the ninety six Olympic Taekwondo team. How did they even know that? I would I would presume it was my pedigree as a kickboxer and just okay. martial arts. Somebody had to nominate me. I'm assuming. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah, I don't even know <laughs> it could have been one of my old coaches. I don't know. Okay. All I know is, I, I, you know, this wasn't in the days where you had internet, you know, easy access. Exactly. To internet, yeah. email. You, you had to ask, who is this guy? Here's the number. Let me call this person and wind up talking to this person who was the coach of the Olympic Taekwondo team for the United States of America. Okay. Han Wan Lee was his name. Okay. And uh, talking with him. Just tried to figure out, hey, how can I start this tryout process? You know, obviously my name was thrown into the hat. What do I have to do to see if I have what it takes to make it? Yeah. And um, he wound up setting up an opportunity at uh, Nickel State University okay. uh, here because it was local to my area, but uh, they, they were traveling doing tryouts. And I had an opportunity to spar uh, a 92 uh, medalist and an 88 medalist, mm-hmm. gold and silver, uh, to to get out there and, and, you know, it was sink or swim. It was like trial by fire. Okay. All right. And, um, originally this was supposed to happen in Colorado Springs, but they wind up, Hey, we're coming to your region. How far is Nickel State for you? Not that far at all. I'll try. I'll try. Yeah. Why not? (laughs) So it it showed up and it was kind of a private closed off session Yeah, and, uh, was able to spar and ultimately outscore the, the two former medalists, and I was much heavier, you know, so I was slower. Okay. Should have been slower, but I had a lot of speed for my size. They were looking for a heavyweight spot for me, and uh, I wound up securing my uh, my way on that team. And that very evening after it was done, I was given this. All the athletes got that, or the people that made the team got Oh, wow. Players. Okay. USA, I, yes. I dug this out of storage for you. That's nice. <laughs> That's nice. Okay. I don't. I don't wear this very often, but oh, you don't do okay. I don't, not normally, but I said, you know, today I'm going to bring because I figured we would bring this up. And, That's uh, awesome. And and that was uh, that was their way of saying you're on you're you're on the team. Okay, so let, let me get this straight. So without any type of. You didn't like lead up to like train for this. You kind of went in cold turkey. And I, just... I went. In, I had a little bit of notice. I, okay. I had probably four months, okay, or so of time where yeah. I was like, you know, I got to get, get the rust off because I haven't really competed okay. competitively, and it was at least five years. Five years. Yeah. So uh, you... four or five years at least because I was in the workforce. I and I had a kid at this time. I'm. I'm a dad. I got to go earn a living. Yeah. <laughs> so five years removed, and you took four months to get ready, and you beat out these people. these former medalists to uh, oh, to, to earn a spot. You know, um, that's a story. That's a good. It was, it was I, I'm, I'm sure story. you felt it was it was a little. I, I always try to explain to people. I feel that I had an advantage. Yes, I was competing in Taekwondo. Okay. But I had a lot of other martial arts experience through professional kickboxing, through learning other disciplines that I felt gave me an edge okay. over the typical person that studied just Taekwondo. 
I had to deal within the Taekwondo rules and parameters where I couldn't punch the head. Mm. I can only kick the head. I can punch the body or kick, but you know, you know what I mean? It was a little different okay. than kickboxing. But I had quite a quite an experience as a martial artist coming up that I didn't realize how unique it was until I was an adult and started to talk to other peers. And it's like, wait a minute. That was so unusual what my coach did for me. The things he had me do was so different and special that I had no idea because that was my only true experience through martial arts is what I learned through my coach. And then, you know, it's it's kind of a – we'll have to get into more details of yeah. that, but to kind of finish up the Olympic yeah, yeah, yeah. tryout part, uh-huh. it I felt that it's like it was almost almost unfair, you know, Wait a minute. to, to Whoa, me. That, uh- it was unfair to them. I mean, I, I felt that I you had, were better trained. I was better trained and better prepared. Although I didn't have as much time, I think my unusual knowledge of having a wider view of mar- of more martial arts systems and mm-hmm. angles and concepts, I think, gave me an advantage. Over had I been doing the had I walked on the same journey they did, just strictly talk on. I, I may have not defeated beat. them. I may have gotten beat. Okay, you know. Uh, yeah. I felt like I had an advantage that they didn't have just because of what I was exposed to as a martial artist in such a intensive way. And, a, 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 you know, we're only talking maybe a 10 year period yeah. of my life mm-hmm. where I was just engrossed in this stuff. Mm-hmm. You know, did you did you <laughs> did you go to them and the judge and be like, hey, man, like I've had more training, so. I don't think that this is fair. <laughs> no, no, it wasn't anything like that. This is all in hindsight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, let, let me tell you that. And, you know, and, and there again, I, I don't know how, how competitive those guys were leading up. They, they, as far as I know, the last time they competed was the 92 games or the 88 games. Okay. But I know they, they were guys that they thought, hey, if he can hang with these guys, yeah. he, he's in. Well, know? I will say this. I will say this. You, you, you are a humble man. Because if that were me, <laughs> I wouldn't know. I'd say, hey, I beat him. I couldn't tell anybody. <laughs> yeah, like, like, there was like, one person in my life that knew, and that was my cousin, Kevin Johnson. Because he was the one that drove me there. He was the one that was like my... my he, was the, he was the guy that everybody wanted to be. He was kind of like the Fonz on Happy Days. He would get oh, all nice. the girls. He would yeah. hit the jukebox and something would start playing. I mean, he was just one of those guys that just... He was larger than life. Mm-hmm. He, he, uh, he died young in life. Too. Um, yeah. But at that time, he kept that secret for me. You know, he he drove me religiously. He went to go hit the, the weights. I went to go hit the mats. You know, and the see, bags and and he uh, he looked out for me. You know, that's good. So you you know, and you always from from what I hear with just sports or, or anything where you're trying to give it your all, you need at least one person that's going to be that that there for you most of the time. Mm-hmm. And and so oh, he for, was there. Yeah, for for you, Absolutely. it was him. Yeah, I I looked up to him. Yeah, you know, he he wasn't a lot older than me, but he's yeah. obviously old enough to drive. He was, you know, he was good with the women, the yeah. girls. He was just he was charismatic. Someone you wanted to be. Like, Absolutely. Yeah. Everybody wanted to be, you know, him. It's just it's just who he was. Okay. Um, but to finish the taekwondo, yeah, yeah. the taekwondo Olympic thing, what what wound up happening is after. You know, saying, "Hey, you 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 got a spot. Mm-hmm. You know, you're my number one heavyweight. We got an alternate lined up in case you're injured or something happens, whatever." Yeah. Um, here's going to be your assignment. There's your room assignment in Colorado Springs. Got to mm-hmm. move to the Olympic Training Center. All that stuff. We're getting super That's excited nice. about this. Like, oh my yeah. god, my life's about to change. Quit my job. Yeah. You know, because why you, not? You, yeah, you got, it's you got the to. Olympics. You yeah. got to. And uh, a decision was made by the International Olympic Committee. About a week or two before I was supposed to go to Colorado Springs, it said, "Hey guys, pump the brakes. We're not gonna. We're gonna wait till the year 2000 to debut Taekwondo as a full metal sport. Up to that point, it was just an exhibition or demonstration sport where the where the uh, metal count did not count toward the country's total. Okay. So it was more just kind of like." And 96 was going to be the year. Hey, man, yeah. it's in Atlanta, Georgia. Mm-hmm. We're going to, we're gonna you know. Blow it up. We're going to blow it up. Mm-hmm. Well, they decided let's wait to the year 2000. So all the 96 athletes oh that went through gosh. all the Olympic trials, all the process, basically we said, hey, guys, thanks for trying out. You know, if what you want was, to, 
in the year 2000, we're going to... Come gonna, back, yeah, four years later. What was their reasoning for that? Did they give you They a really reason? didn't give one. It was a very cold four model by the IOC. It was like, well, sorry to inform you. I was like, oh, my God, I quit my job. Yeah. <laughs> so, so. I got a young kid <laughs> that was, you know... And two kids now, you know, baby, it, it's like, Ooh. are you serious? You know, I, I was going for broke. Okay, so so at that point, like, how do how do you like shift from that? Like, what what happened? Well, I, I took a a hard look, you know, and, and I always believe, hey, God is giving me yes something. You know, mm-hmm. He's trying to tell me something, mm-hmm. and I took a hard look at it. So you know, for some reason or another, martial arts grabbed me again. And okay. it pulled me in, you mm-hmm. know, because I was like, hey, I'm family got working behind the desk and a <laughs> insurance she mortgage. Hated that <laughs> job, though. <didn't laughs> <you? laughs> <laughs> Caged down all yeah. there. It, it, it wasn't really working. Uh-uh. But you know, I, I was doing it. It's what I, it's what you were expected to do. And uh, for me, it was like, well, you know what? I'm not working. I suddenly got pulled by the martial art bug again. Mm-hmm. I'm going to open up my own gym, my own martial arts school. You know, okay. never thought of doing this. You know, yeah. and said, you know, I can. I can perhaps change some lives like martial arts changed mine. Okay. And, and you know, in 1995, mm-hmm. I wound up opening Gold Dragon. And, and instead of coming off of the Olympics, because I was torn because, like, you know, I'm coming off of the Olympic trials. I can, like, put Olympic rings on everything. Boom, 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 you know, Olympic, mm-hmm. Taekwondo. That, and I said, you know, that's not where my heart is. You know, yeah. I was exposed to a lot of different martial arts and realized that the truth of martial arts was learning all the ranges of fighting. And Taekwondo did not address grappling, Mm -hmm. throws. It was kicks, primarily kicks, 70% kicks, 30% punches. And a lot of it was flashy. You know, a lot of it was uh, beautiful. You know, it's beautiful to watch. Yeah, yeah. But in reality, they're not as practical as some of the more basic techniques. So Mm -hmm. I said, you know what? I'm going to take the opportunity of teaching a true mixed martial art before the term was coined mixed martial arts. You got in before. I got in before because you didn't really see. (coughs) The UFC, I believe, came around in 1993. But at that point, it was still individual disciplines. It was like kind of like a freak show. It was like. Mm -hmm. Kung Fu versus Sumo. Yeah. Six hundred pound guy versus a two hundred pound. You know, no, you well, know it was interesting. Though. It was interesting. Yeah. And, and if anything, it proved that one on one jujitsu was superior. Okay. You know. Okay. When it's a street fight and somebody can soccer kick your head when you're on the ground engaged with somebody else trying to do a joint lock. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it proved that one on one in a cage jujitsu was a, a, a superior art. Gotcha. And and so a lot of people it brought jiu-jitsu to the forefront because jiu-jitsu has been around for a long time. Mm-hmm. It's, you know, it's from Japan. The, the Brazilians, I guess, popularized it through the UFC. Yeah. But uh, it's been around for a long time. And it always took a backseat to the flashier things. Karate, yeah. Kung Fu, Taekwondo, Tang Soo Do. And um, it, it just brought it to the forefront. Now, all of a sudden, people are like, oh, this stuff really works, you know. So instead of looking at, like, I just want to do jiu-jitsu, it's like... You know, I already do jiu-jitsu. I'm starting a jiu-jitsu black belt at this point. Yeah. And it's like, but I'm also a striker, you know. Right. So I want to I want to teach people how to do it all. And it was really from a self-defense standpoint. I wasn't yeah. even thinking about the sport uh-huh. because the sport hadn't evolved that much yet at that point when I opened in 95. It wasn't until probably the late 90s before you started to see people truly start to blend where you had – Guys that were like a boxer that could also wrestle. You're like, yeah. wait, here's a guy who's got a couple of disciplines mm-hmm. in his arsenal. And I, I think through jujitsu's success in the early UFCs, people started to, who were strikers, add jujitsu to their arsenal. And, and then they eventually became what you see today, you know, okay. truly mixed martial arts. So, so that first, take me through your first class. Like, you, you, you get it built, mm-hmm. ready to go. And you're like, all right, here, here it is. Here we go. <laughs> so, what was those first like couple of classes like? It was it was actually pretty neat because it, as any business, well, uh, I don't know, any business, but mine, it, it started yeah. slowly. So, okay. you know, I would get one student. Okay. Then next week I'd get another student, another student. So, you know, it started off having like somebody that I can like, hey, here's a sponge. Mm-hmm. I can pour my knowledge into this kid, and, yeah, and, and really get him, you know, to. 
to see the light bulbs go off. You're like, oh my gosh, it makes total sense now. And it's just like, wow, this is really fun. And I really enjoyed the teaching aspect a lot more than I thought I would. Okay. <clears throat> because, you know, it's like, it kind of reminded me of my journey when I first saw a move that I thought was just amazing. Or I, I, I learned the little piece of the puzzle I was missing that was not allowing a certain technique to work. And then when I learned it, it was like, boom, <laughs> you know, mind blown. My whole world just changed. I enjoyed watching that. It's that spark in people's minds. Okay, mind. just like the teacher does in the classroom. Absolutely. That, yeah. Absolutely. When you see okay. a kid that finally gets it, that's yeah. been struggling, you're like, oh, this is great. And then when you take it one step farther and you see them put their own spin on something mm -hmm. that makes it uniquely their own, mm -hmm. that's what it's about. And, and, and to me, and, and I, I believe that's what made Gold Dragon stand out tremendously, is I had... And I'd like to get into more details of my martial art upbringing because yeah, I think yeah. it's going to be cool. Yeah. But I was encouraged to alter some of the techniques, provided it didn't alter the underlying principles that made it work. You know, and, and that gives you me, your own style. Absolutely. Because. And that's what makes it yours. It, it, if, if you it don't have a style. If it makes it yours, yeah. you're more likely going to retain it, exactly. and it's going to become part of you to where something happens, pow, you just do it. Yeah. And you're like, true learning. I didn't even think about it. I just reacted because yeah. it was a part of me and not just some foreign thing that's trying to get crammed some down my form. throat. Right. Yeah. You do it this way yeah. because your pinky toe was three millimeters out of alignment. That's not good yeah, and acceptable. Yeah, yeah. You must redo this. And it's... A lot of martial arts were rigid like that. Mm -hmm. And uh, in a lot of respects, even a lot of jujitsu is rigid like that. You have to do it this way or it's not a, a jujitsu armbar or a Brazilian jujitsu armbar. Or, mm -hmm. you know, I always said, hey, people are different body types. Yes. I'm a bigger guy. Yeah. There's going to be big man moves mm -hmm. and there's going to be smaller guy moves. You're mm -hmm. not going to see me pull off a lot of flying armbars or flying anything because yeah. it takes a lot of energy to get my body off the ground. There's a Cormier <laughs> and then there's an Israel Desani. Exactly. Yeah. So... You know, to me, and it was very important to me, is to give the students some flexibility in creating, you know, who's to say that all the moves have been created? You know, there's 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 new moves in jiu-jitsu being created all the time, or variations. Give you them know, an opportunity. Give them an opportunity. To become an artist. Give them the environment to do so without penalizing them for creativity. Okay. And, and you know, and, and if, if something is, they're doing... <clears throat> gets them in trouble, I'd rather have them learn it here and say, hey, you know, that's great, but what you're not considering is your face is wide open. Got you. And, and we're not just, remember, we're not just jujitsu guys. You have to consider what's going to happen out there on the street. Is there going to be multiple attackers? What's the environment going to be like? Is oh, it going to wow. be, a, is it going to be mats? Is there going to be wow, improvised okay. weapons? Yeah. You, you got to, you have to assume that your jiu-jitsu or your martial art techniques have got to work everywhere, not just in a controlled that environment under a certain, certain set of rules. So in, a, in an age where a lot of people, the jiu-jitsu, it, it flows in evolutions. Yeah. Right now, everybody's pulling guard. We call them butt, butt floppers. Okay. They're flopping to their butt, and they're like, come get in my guard. Yeah. Well, you do that in a street fight. Somebody's going to soccer kick your head smooth off your shoulders Done. if they're a skilled fighter. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? But the rules of the sport protect them and get them, they build bad habits, in my opinion. Yeah. You know, if you're used to pulling guard on the street, if you try to jump and pull guard, somebody can just slam your head on the concrete. Guess what? Boom, it's game over. It's over with. Yep. You know, and so. And these are things you got to look out for. For me, you for know, you, yeah. to me, I, I don't look at it like I'm not training these guys for a sport. I'm training them to defend their lives. And, and sometimes we have to alter. Uh, some of the things we can do because of the sport. Mm -hmm. And obviously, we can't groin kick at MMA. Of course. Should you know how to do a groin kick? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> you should. But you don't want to have all your habits, especially for main positions, based on the rules of a sport protecting your ass. Gotcha. <laughs> you, know, yeah. you, you need to cover your own butt. Okay, so... You know? so talk to me about like the, the, the hardships... Of, of running a um, you know MMA like Dojo because like, you know you see the flash and you see oh, the yeah. belts on the wall and all the oh but but take us through like the hardships of it. The hardships, the hardest part for me as a coach is investing my time and effort and energy into someone that um, 
disappoints you or or just or just randomly leaves your gym. That's hard for me as a coach uh, okay. because you're a family. You know, you yeah, build yeah, your yeah. family atmosphere, and it isn't because you know you fail them. Mm -hmm. They just you know it's one thing to quit, mm -hmm. but when you have a person leave and they go do something else. I'm or train somewhere else. And that's happened. That has happened. Yeah. How do you deal with it? There's been times I wanted to shut the doors of my gym because it's just wow. like it's not worth it. You know, wow. because you 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 know, people aren't just a number here. They're family. Gotcha. You know. I've had people and I don't wanna yeah. throw names yeah, out no, yeah, people under the bus. No, no, but no, I've no. had people in the past, they, they get they get lured by other people that might look flashier. This guy's got this mm -hmm. pedigree. Or this guy fought in the UFC. Or the, but you know, never mind the fact that your guy's on a ten fight winning streak and undefeated. Yeah, people get in your ear. Oh man, what you need to do is this, and what you need to do is this, and what you need to do to get to that next Stop level is this. Too much. They don't realize it till it's too late, and they burn their bridges. Uh, you know what I mean? Or or they, or they just uh, they can't they. They can't save face enough to come back. Mm -hmm. And I've seen that happen because I know that we're preparing people better than anyone in our region. And, and it's not because I think we're just superior athletes. Mm -hmm. It's everything that this gym has been built around has been MMA. We're not a jiu-jitsu school that has some MMA fighters. We're not a kickboxing school that has some MMA fighters. Mm -hmm. We are an MMA school. Yeah. Everything we do is geared to the sport of MMA. For instance, I'll give you a good example. Yeah. Uh, a lot of jiu-jitsu schools, 90% of their training is in a gi, which is a formal uniform. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. That gi at one time was just a kimono in Japan. Uh, the more it got used to grab grip, it got thicker and you know, more robust. And, and before you know it, it's like, oh, it's a part of the, the, the thing. You know, yeah, yeah, this yeah. Is, The art started to evolve around the uniform. Uh, yeah. We live in the South. It's hot. Nobody wears hot parkers and jackets. It's hot. It's hot. Very, very rarely. So all of our jiu-jitsu is based on body parts. Okay. Our jiu-jitsu will work in a nudist camp. <laughs> well, that's <Right>? good to know. <laughs> <laughs> not that you want to be doing yeah, that. No. But it's not reliant on clothing and sport rules to work for you. It works so it on works. the street. It can work on the street. It also can work in the cage and, and sporting, too. Um, so everything we do, we don't have just some no gi classes. Everything is no gi here. Everything is learning how to use wrist control, underhooks. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, learning different grips on the body and you can control them. And it's a lot more difficult to do that because people start to sweat. They get slick. Yep. You know, if you have a gi, poof, grab that lapel, yeah, grab that sleeve. Yeah, you got poof, them. You're locked in, mm -hmm. and you find that people that grapple with gis. Or it's a lot slower and more methodical. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of times, no gi jiu-jitsu is like you took two cats in a box, shook it up, and let them go. To, <laughs> you, you got this going. That's but that's analogy. that's that's a that's a lot of the mentality of how to how to train. You got to yeah. learn how to just use the body and don't rely on clothing okay. or belts. Because you know, even grab a belt. You know, to me, if it's there on the street, sure, Easy. someone's gonna yeah. But don't rely. Don't let your jujitsu or your technique rely on clothing or belts to be successful and effective. Okay, so you um, <coughs> talked about you know how um, you you started this uh, gym and what you teach here. So what are some of the like results? Like what's been going on in present day? Present right day, so far, uh, our, we have a, a great budding fight team this year. And, and fight teams come in cycles. You know, okay. we, we have a group of guys that, are, that are come together, come up together and do great things. And then life gets in the way. They get married. They have kids. Yeah, yeah. They get real jobs. And it's, it's cyclical. Yeah. Um, right now, we have a, a great group of fighters. We are undefeated for the year 2022. We are, we're 10-0 right now. It's uh, July. Yeah, it's just, we're doing, wow. We're doing we're doing quite well. That's um, awesome. We have five guys fighting next week. Hopefully, we'll keep that streak alive. We have two amateur title shots coming up next week, and oh. we have a professional debut. So, and they all are telling me it's the year of the dragon. <laughs> so hey, I'm gonna nice. go with it. Although in you know Chinese mythology, it's not the year of the dragon. But guess what? Hey, it is the it year. Yeah, just, we're just gonna let it go. It's yeah. the year of the dragon this year, and they're. They're doing great things, you know. They're um, they're they're doing they're they're coachable. They're uh, they're 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 putting the time in. They're humble, and we have a great just a great group of guys and a great group of coaches that are helping these guys get prepared. Okay, so 
you, you mentioned two title shots. Mm -hmm. How do you get someone prepared for a title shot? Is there a different mindset that you have to go in <coughs> when you're chasing the goal? I would say it's not a whole lot different because these guys are training for opponents that are, I guess, in our minds a lot tougher than they sometimes are in reality. So we're always training for the worst case scenario. We want them to be adequately prepared. We want the toughest guys for them to fight to be their training partners. Okay. To where the fight is easy. Gotcha. You know, they say, cry in the dojo, laugh on the battlefield. Okay. You know, and that's the yeah. idea. You train them super hard. You train them harder. There are some instances, there are some organizations that will have a five-round amateur title. Uh, it's five rounds instead of three. So that would be the only difference that we have to train for two more rounds. So we have to make sure that cardio might be a little bit more geared to a five round fight as opposed to a three round fight. Okay. But uh, a lot of the amateur titles are also three round fights too. So it's okay. to, for, for those, it's really no different. Okay. We'll, we'll tend to train for the individual, you know, so the more we can know about our opponents, the more we can adequately train our, our fighters to be prepared for their skill set. Okay, but other than that, it's... Yeah, it's just, a, you know, it's about putting the grind in, putting mm -hmm. the time in, continue to learn, mm -hmm. continue to get better, um, but also prepare for your opponent's strong suits. Okay. And then, you know, so it's, it's ultimately whoever can implement their game plan typically will want to fight. That makes sense. You know? so, so, you know, we talked about, you know, the, the hard days and, and things like that. Has, has there ever been, or are there people that come in that you kind of have to shun, like, hey, you know, I'm going to have to ask you to leave, or I don't think this is for you. Have you ever had to do that, turn we've, someone away? We've, we've, it tends to take care of itself. Okay. Um, typically, when people come in, and, and we get this from time to time, hey, man, they'll come in here, I, I took a fight in two weeks. Can you get me ready for it? We're like, no. <laughs> because number one, we don't know anything about you. Okay. And two weeks isn't enough time for us to have you represent Gold Dragon yeah, with our cornermen. And, you know, it, it just isn't going to work. You got a reputation to uphold. And normally, I will tell these people, what event are you fighting on? I can get you out of this fight because I've been in this business a long time. I know all the matchmakers, all the promoters. Okay. I'll get you out of this fight. We'll accept you into our gym, and let's get you ready, you know, because no promoter should be dealing with the fighters directly. They should deal with a coach, a reputable coach, because okay. generally what happens is that, you know, and you do have some promotions that will deal with fighters directly and not their coaches. Yeah, yeah. A lot of those guys will flake out on you. You know, you're training hard for a fight. Really? You, you, absolutely. We, we've had, uh, for oh. well, Naja Harvey, this is like his fifth opponent. Wait, they, they we've had five, that? four different opponent changes. So we're on opponent number five for this title shot he has this weekend, and <clears throat> and sometimes they're very legitimate excuses. Like there's one gentleman um, who I believe is uh, trying to be a corrections officer, and he has a certain class that he has to do. Well, I get that, you know, okay, that, that kind of yeah, came yeah. up. But a lot of times it's just like I hadn't seen I hadn't seen that guy showing up. He's not returning my phone calls. Well, who's this coach? Well, he's independent. Well, there you go. Okay. He's got so nobody you, to yeah. answer to. Whereas no these guys to. know they have to answer to me. If, gotcha. if, if Coach, since he ain't happy, ain't nobody happy. Oh, uh, yeah. So that's why I tell these guys, don't ever th talk to promoters and matchmakers. If they contact you. Tell them to contact you. You tell them to contact me. Got you. You, okay. you be respectful. Yeah. You tell them, oh. There's I, a chain of command. There's a chain of command. And, and, and then. The, the promoters will no, now know that, hell, oh, his guys are off limits. I can't, because normally they're not, for the most part, I don't want to say, I don't want to lump everybody in. Mm. Promoters aren't looking out for the best interest of your fighter. Well, of course not. I mean, they want right. To, they, they want to put on a show. Yeah. They want to put asses in a seat. They want yeah. to sell, you know, sell, sell concessions tickets. and yeah. you know, tickets. So to me, it, it, just knowing that they have somebody that's been representing the area for 27 years, they know they're not going to pull any BS on me. They know. So already... They're like, all right, let's uh, not even go We can't this. do this, <laughs> this, or this, or this, or this guy. We got to make sure we do things right. Yeah, yeah. You know, I'm not... You know, I don't want easy fights from my opponents okay. and from my, from my fighters. They need to grow from their fights. There's some fights that just don't make sense. Mm -hmm. You know, like... At if you, the moment, yeah. At the moment, 
But you know we're not, not ducking people, that, right? You don't duck people. Okay. You you look to build your fighters and get them better and, and, and get them an opponent that where if they bring their A game, they could win that fight. If they don't bring their A game, they'll probably lose that fight. That makes sense. And, and that way they grow because level it, of effort. If you're beating in my day, we used to call them tomato cans. If you're fighting nothing but tomato cans, cans. tomato cans, yeah, so that's old nice. school. That's, that's nice. old school. Okay. So if you're fighting guys that have no business being in a cage, you're smashing those people. And your record's twenty and zero. What does that mean? Nothing. It means nothing. The first time you you come across somebody who's worth a damn, you're gonna get smashed and you're gonna get exposed. Exactly. You know, so to me, it's like every fight we're trying to build these guys up a little more, a little more, a little more, and then they're they're you know, should you have a guy that's got three fights fighting guy that's got thirty fights and is undefeated? No, that doesn't make no, sense. That's... You know, Ugh. but they'll do that to the independent guy. Hey, guy, we got a we got a fight for you. You're going to be the main event. And they're like, sweet, I'm the main event. And they're you know, they're not ready for they're the main posted event. on their social media, and they think, well, they 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 selected me because I'm that good. Yeah. They're calling me. It's like no, they're calling you because nobody else wants to take that fight. And then uh, you're not smart enough to say, eh, you know, your ego is too big to, to back out of that. You get in the cage, get smashed, and then it's over. I've seen it happen so Jeez. many times over the years. Have you... Okay, so so have, has there been a, a time where you've had to step in to one of your fighters and say, we're not taking that fight? And there was a, like, the fighter was mad. No, oh, absolutely. Thought, okay, so how, how how do you deal with with that type of commotion? I know it's just basically yeah, and, and that normally happens <clears throat> when these guys try to do things outside of me. Okay, as the you know because the way I look at it, I, I'm like the principal of the school. Gotcha. My gotcha. coaches are my teachers. You know because I, I I'm not involved in the day to day coaching, but I kind of oversee everything. Okay, you know so it gives me more time to you know take care of. Everything with the gym that needs to be taken care of, all the business aspects of mm-hmm. running a gym. Mm-hmm. But also, I 100% deal with the promoters and matchmakers and, and, and manage these fight careers. So mm-hmm. it's kind of like we all have our jobs. Mm-hmm. You know, if I see something that needs to get corrected with a, with a, one of my coaches, I can could, I could talk to them privately and kind of tell them what I'd like to see more of, especially mm-hmm. for <clears throat> certain fights or certain things. Hey, we got to make sure this guy's getting more of this, this, and this uh, because his last fight, he showed weakness in these areas, and, and his opponent is really good at those things that he's weak at, so let's let's address these things. So a okay. lot of times I will do that, but most of the time my coaches are on top of it because they're with these guys on the daily. Yeah, They're cornering at the fight, so they're, they're, they're pretty involved. Very rarely do I say something that comes out of the blue to them, and that's, that's just a testament that they're ready to, gotcha. to coach, and, and they're doing a good job, and they're, they learn the right way okay. along the way. Right. But from time to time, you'll have somebody – well, like, oh, such and such challenged me on Facebook. So? <laughs> you know? Or, so they're like, I got to answer that. I got to answer that. And I admire the fact that these guys are fighters and, like, I'll fight anybody. And I, that's great. Yeah, that's what you want. <laughs> that's what I want. Yeah. But you have to let me be your voice, you know, because I'm looking out for your best interest. I'm not preparing you for your next fight. I'm preparing for the fourth fight after this one where I'm building you up to fight for that title. Okay. And then we're going to go fight for this title. And then you're going to turn professional. So I'm yeah. looking at it in a broader picture. And they're just looking at, such and such called me out. I think I can beat him. Blah, let's do it. Like, no, it don't work that way. Yes. You don't make your own fights. That you makes know? sense. No, I mean, that makes sense. There, there's a, there's a, a chain of command. There's a way to do it right. Absolutely. And people who don't do it right get, get smashed, and that's the end of it. They get smashed, and the sad part about it is it takes a lot of guts to get in a cage and fight. Oh, yeah. You know, it, to me, yeah. I, I look at those guys, and, and, I, and, I, and I feel badly for them because I'm like, man, here's a guy who's doing what 99% of the population would never do. Mm-hmm. He's stepping in a cage. Now, he might mm-hmm. not be training right for it. He might not be. He might miss weight by ten pounds, <laughs> but they don't care because he's being slaughtered at the altar of their golden boy. Yes, and and, and that happens, That's and, it, and it, it it complicates things because number one, it boosts their ego because they're like they thought I was good enough to get a title shot, which is first wrong. Mm-hmm. You're the you're the first sucker that that took him up on. You're a lamb to the slaughter. Absolutely, and to me, it's like a guy like that. I want to protect. I want to. Hey, man, look. Don't talk to any more promoters. Lose their numbers. Block their numbers even better. Mm-hmm. Get off of social media. Come here and start training. We're going to get you the right fights at the right time. Manage you properly. And, and, and so you don't get taken advantage of. Because you're doing what most people will never do. Step in a cage and fight. Yeah. that that And that makes a lot of sense. You know, like, um, and that's with, with, I guess, all sports, all things. You, you have to know 
where your limit is. And sure. sometimes, most of the time, you need someone who's been there to let you, to calm you down. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. To, to bring you down, bring it down to reality. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'm sorry. I was just emotional. I wasn't thinking. Yeah, I'll let you handle it. And then boom, we're golden. You mm -hmm. know. And uh, but it, it's but it's it's frustrating as a coach to have a guy. And it, it's it's happened a couple times just since we've been in Picky. I mean, I already took a fight. It's like why why <laughs> <laughs> why did you do that? It's like first of all, don't ever fight for that promotion because that promotion should not be dealing with you directly. Yeah. You know, I realize they have to. Sometimes, but it's always better to deal with legitimate gym. And there's, there's plenty of legitimate gyms that can yeah. train fighters to fight in a cage. Okay. There is. So, so last but not least, I heard that there is someone that you uh, fought back in Europe. <laughs> who told you? <laughs> your your, your, your glory days, out. yeah. <laughs> who is uh, kind of a, a big, was a big deal. He was a big deal. Yeah. Uh, a little Tybo, a little Tybo, Tybo right? yeah, Mr. Was Billy, it? Billy Blanks. Billy Blanks. Um, Take it, us through that, man. What? That, <laughs> wow. That was one of one of my uh, kickboxing opponents back in the day. Okay. Um, I, I, as a young man who who got into martial arts because I needed something. Mm -hmm. I need I needed something to keep me channeled and keep me from going the wrong path. I poured mm -hmm. my heart into it. I poured everything into it. And it's a little different than people think today. Like. I, my, my guys have a coach that look out for them. Yeah. I was doing all this stuff. You're doing it by yourself. You, you show up, right? Like, who's who's here to fight? Me? You? Y'all look close. Boom. Y'all fight. You know, it was so wild, less wild formal. West. It was wild, wild west. Right. Yeah. You, you, got, you will get off the, put that beer down. <laughs> get off the bar stool. Wait, look, there's, been, there's been times, there's been shows I've seen that. <laughs> where it's like, what? that guy was just drinking. He wasn't even scheduled to fight. And they got that guy fighting because somebody backed out or something That's like dangerous. that. dangerous. It's not smart. <laughs> Fortunately, there's medical staff. Okay, and, you know, there, there's a ringside physician, medical. You know, a judges, referee. That could, you know, there, oh there's there's some there's some uh, safety valve set in place. Okay. Uh, but you know, then it's like you you just took fights. You know, and I didn't care who I fought. You know, to me, I was I was fighting the demons inside of me. I wasn't okay. fighting the opponent, and I didn't even know who this guy was until afterwards. You know, to me, it was just like, that's another victim. Mm -hmm. That's a guy I'm going to go smash. Mm -hmm. I got to do my thing. I got to hit my Man. switch, and I, and I got to do this. And to me, like I said, it was it was controlling the monster in me. Okay. Because I, like I said, I had so much I was dealing with as a young man mm -hmm. uh, that, that if I didn't have that to release that pressure where I could hit somebody as hard as I want and try to knock them out, and I never got in trouble for it, like, that was the best thing ever. That was ever. the best thing in the world. Yeah. <laughs> it really was. It's like a... You know, especially another athlete who's training. It's like I'm picking on somebody on the street. Hey, you. Ah, you know. <laughs> it's like, here's a guy who's training. Let's get out here and let, let's let's test our skills and may the better man win. Mm -hmm. And um, and, and I, I did, was very successful. I went 26-0, and 0, 24 knockouts. Huh? Um, yeah. 26-0. 26-0. Yeah, and it's, uh, I, I went, you know, it, it was it's a little different environment. You know, like, mm -hmm. could people go 26-0 and in MMA? It, it's a, it's 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 apples and oranges. Yeah. It really it really is different. Uh, I I think the athletes today are better trained mm -hmm. than I was. I had a leg up. I, I still say I had a leg up. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, I had a, a a head guy who looked out for me, took him under, took me under his wing in terms of hey, I'm gonna bring these guys in, and he was bringing in guys that I didn't even know who they were. Later right. on, I'm like, oh, okay, I just know that's that's Takizawa. He mm -hmm. teaches Wadoru and. Uh, King Ree, he's a Taekwondo guy, and wow. Brian Hawkins, he's a Kempo guy. He was bringing these people in whenever he could to train with me. Wow. You know, because I guess he saw that I needed something in my life. Okay. And to me, that was normal. You didn't even think about it. I didn't even it. think about it. To me, I'm like, oh, this is cool. You yeah. know, and, and it's like, wow, you know, I, I was getting exposed to multiple martial arts. And of course, I was learning jujitsu from Master Martin himself, you know, yeah. who was. So it's like, I really didn't realize how special. He normalized it. He normalized it for me. It wasn't until I was running my own gym, I was like, this is crazy. Yeah. You know? That's good. <laughs> and especially in those times, because we're talking, you know, 1983, you know, mm -hmm. the, the 80s. You know, you, you didn't do, you didn't cross train. And, mm -hmm. and this guy was. Obviously, pretty influential. He owned a, a big health club called Crescent City Health Club. He was okay. a jiu-jitsu and judo black belt. Yeah. Um, he had patents on weightlifting equipment. This was a smart guy. I didn't find out this till later. Wow. You know, I was just a fourteen-year-old punk who was like, 
I don't want to kill somebody, so I need to do, do this. this. Yeah. I need to do this, or I'm going to go off the deep end and do something that I'm going to regret. Okay. And um, which led me into my kickboxing. And although he was my mentor, I was kickboxing. Like, hey, they got fights Saturday night. Here, boom, boom, boom. So you go. just, it's, hey, Billy Blanks, duh. We're yeah, just going to fight him. He's my weight. Let's fight. <laughs> yeah. All right, so what happened? <clears throat> we wound up fighting. I, I kind of found out a little bit of intel before the fight. Yeah. Just somebody like, oh man, you know who that is? Like, no, nah, I have no idea. That's Billy Blanks. Like, Billy who? I don't know this guy. <laughs> right. Like, it, it's like, man, he's like the PKO world champion. I'm like, really? PKO? And at the time, there was only two organizations that were main organizations in the United States. It was the PKA and the PKL. This was a PKA fight. It wasn't the PKL, so he, he didn't have a title on line. Like, I'm just like, I'm man. fighting somebody. And it's like, man, you got to watch that dude. That dude will like, he'll do like a front flip and catch you with his heel. And he's good at that. I'm like, man, that guy ain't going to hit me. What are you talking about? This guy's going to do ninja flips on me? I'm going to kick my ass. I'm going to get out there. I'm going to smash this guy, right? <clears throat> like I did the rest of the guys. And this was my, uh, oh, gosh, I'm trying to I'm trying to think what fight that was. I mean, it was in okay. somewhere, it was it was toward the middle end of my career as a fighter. It wasn't okay. one of my first fights or anything like that. So, you know, I was pretty seasoned by this point. And I'm yeah. like, you know, I'm going to go out there. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do my thing just like I always do. Yeah. And son of a gun, that guy did that flip that I knew was coming, and he caught me with it. And I was so upset. I, I, my ego was just like crushed. But you said he wasn't going to do that. That's what I said. <laughs> he, he was pretty good at it. It's okay. kind of like, you know, Kung Lee had a scissor. Flip yeah. He caught everybody with it. Even when you knew it was coming, he caught you with it. Hmm. Well, he, he grazed me. Thankfully, it was a graze. I knew enough. If I wasn't told... By that guy, one of the guys in the back, what that guy would do. He may have caught me flush, and it could have, could have been lights out. It could Saved have been my first life. loss. <laughs> <laughs> and he grazed me. Caught yeah, me on yeah. the, you know, my chin was always down because the tires kicked out your chin down, hands up. He caught me on the top of the head as I was backing up. And, and you know, of course, he winds up vulnerable on the ground. Yeah. The rules of the sport protect me from stomping him, but yeah. I wanted to stomp him. Well, I, bet. I was like, yeah. Yeah, I And then uh, that wound up right toward the end of the round. Second round starts, my ego's bruised, <laughs> but uh -oh. I'm mad. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> I'm, I'm upset. So uh, I wound up catching him. It was probably just a basic three jab cross hook and then a, a round kick, and I caught him with that round kick clean on the chin, right on the jawline. And, you know, kind of, kind of not top of the foot, but like lower shin. So I, I knew, it, you know, I, I knew it was, lights it, out. It, it was it, it caught him enough to where he went down and he was. Trying to get up, and it's it's a it's a uh, you could tell he was wobbled. His yeah. legs were rubbery. He didn't done, have his legs yeah. underneath him. And normally the referee will usually grab your gloves and, and mm -hmm. kind of see if you got any tension, and will ask you a question to check your cognitive ability. And he and I I was far enough back because I'd kind of go to my neutral corner, but I can still kind of hear because it's weird when you're fighting. It's like all the crowd disappears, mm -hmm. and you kind of just zone into the I, people I that are so. in your space. Yeah. And he's like, "Do you know where you're at?" And he said, "Thursday." It was a Saturday night. That's it. It's the <laughs> it's ding, a ding, 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 ding. So uh, it, was, it was kind of the running joke. Every time the guys would see me, like, oh, man, you're the guy that knocked that guy in the next Thursday. I'm like, yeah, I got to speak. That's <laughs> nice, man. That's so, nice. Uh, yeah, one of those more memorable things that will stay with me my whole life. Man, well, hey, th this is this has been a I'm, – I'm so glad we finally yes. got to sit down and talk. Um, anything going on that you want to – Check us out, golddragonmma.com. Uh, if you have any questions, don't hesitate to give us a call. All right. Well, I am Vincent Kirkland. This is Lawrence Patrick. Be sure to subscribe uh, after you know the video. And thank you again. And look forward to, to more videos to come. Y'all have a good day.